my Bill for Thousand Nation. How's everyone doing today? Hopefully, everyone's having a great day. If not, I hope it gets better from here. We are back with another That Chapter. This one is titled The Dark, the Dark Plot That Buried Missing People Alive. I cannot speak. All right. It is Halloween. Hopefully, everyone is having a safe and happy holiday. Please. Be very safe out there. People get a little crazy this time of year. All right. Like I said, I'm excited for today's story. This one was actually suggested to me by a subscriber. So let's go ahead and get into it. Go ahead, turn the mice down low. Put on something comfy, couple something special. Whew. Let's get the dark plot that buried missing people alive. Let's get confused. I'm slightly confused on it. Yeah. Let's do it. Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and hey in this Mike. old video, a school bus was driving, right, in California's Central Valley at approximately 4 p.m. This was a drop-off run after a full day at school, and the driver, he was letting kids off at every stop, when he turned a corner and saw that the road was blocked. Blocked by armed men. These men took over the bus that was still full of kids and did something to them. The only word fitting is horrifying. The actions that day were despicable, but the men behind it and what exactly they did was unbelievable. But you better believe it. So let's give it a go. What? I, th I think I heard something about this like in the news. The 15th of July, 1976 nope. was a Thursday, right? Never mind, never mind, never mind. Didn't something happen like this, though, in my lifetime? I was not born in the 70s. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm an 80s baby, all right? No, no, it's bad enough. But didn't something like that happen? In my, I swear, I kind of remember hearing something like that, like, whenever I was younger. <sighs> and that afternoon, just after 4 p.m., Ed Ray, a 55-year-old rancher, was in the middle of the Dairyland Elementary Summer School drop-off run. Ed was happiest when he was working, the kind of guy who would say, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead, you know, the kind who would never retire. Understand he was that. a stocky rancher, stout and tough. But the school run was his downtime, something he found easy compared to the hard labor he was used to. Ed loved kids. He was always patient with them, no matter how boisterous loud they could be. And in fact, this particular day, they were a little bit more excited than usual because they had just come back from a trip to a swimming pool. They were full of excited energy, and Ed took it all in his stride, and he indulged the kids while they sang and called out to each other across the bus. Hell yeah. He just... I mean, back in the 70s, that was probably, like, the shit right there, bro. I wouldn't go to a public pool now. Mm-mm. Got me fucked up. I'll get me, like, one of them little $5 kiddie pools from the Dollar General. I'll fill it up, and I'll just dip my toesies in it and sit out in the yard dropped off a brother and sister and watched them disappear into an endless cornfield on this hot but unusually overcast summer day. This was just around 4.15 p.m. and he was heading off to his next stop. This is on the outskirts of the town of, of Chowchilla. Roads are quiet and all you can see to the left and to the right are endless corn and blueberry fields. But then, driving Sounds his amazing. Course, he was forced to a sudden <coughs> stop. Turning onto Avenue 21, the road in front of him was blocked by a white 1971 Dodge van. Oh, shit. With its doors wide open. White van, people. It, it, nothing ever good happens when there's a white van and kids involved. I ain't scared to say it. No, no, it's not good. Bad things happen. At first, Ed thought little of it, right? He tried to squeeze around the van, tried to squeeze the bus around the van. He thought, you know, maybe somebody was having some car troubles and just decided to park it in the middle of the road very obnoxiously. But then, any doubts of this being an ignorant mistake by a careless driver? Those doubts were well and truly thrown under the bus. Out of nowhere, a man jumped in front of Ed. He was dressed in overalls, with his face all smushed up, 
because a stocking was pulled tightly over his face. Ed's eyes, squinting, were drawn to a gun in this guy's hand, and the iron was looking right at him. Before Ed could react, this Fuck. man walked calmly over to the door of the bus and asked Ed, Could you open the door, please? Ed, shocked and completely blindsided, complied, open the door. Yeah. Two more men in the same uniform joined the... I mean, what do you do in a situation when there's a gun pointed at your fucking face, bruh? Okay. Polite highwayman and boarded the bus. One of the men had a rifle and as soon as he was through the bus door, he had the barrel pointed right at Ed Ray's head as they ordered Ed and the 26 children on board to the back of the bus. Obviously, everyone was terrified. No one had a clue what was happening. The eldest child on the bus was 14. The youngest was five and they all began screaming and crying at the sight of these armed men on the bus, looking scary as all hell. Once they'd successfully herded the kids and Ed to the back of the bus, the man with the rifle took over driving duties and drove a short distance, then parked the bus on a dry riverbed behind a bamboo thicket. The man with the pistol, oh my the first God. guy he'd seen, had been following the school bus in that white van. He then reversed the white van up to the school door, opened the van door, opened the school door. They then split the kids into two groups and had the first group of 12 kids jump over the gap to the back of the van. Once the first 12 were secure, the men coordinated to move the first van away and moved a second green colored van into place to collect Ed and the remaining 14 kids. All this time, one of the men held a shotgun to the chest of a 12 year old girl. That was when Ed began to realize this was an intentional kidnapping. It had been planned, the roadblock, they had two vans ready waiting for him, but God only knows what they're actually going to do to them. Once the door of each van were shut behind them. I'm getting fucking angry. Ah, that's all I know. Oh my God. Any sense of where in the hell they were was completely shut out with the sunlight. The windows were covered and there was a wooden divide blocking the driver's cabin from the back of the van. Other than being, you know, occasionally thrown to the left or to the right when the van took a sharp turn, they had absolutely no idea what was going on. Ed was doing his best to keep the children he was with calm, but his own sense of dread was making it hard to breathe. Damn. Chow Chilla in 1976. I don't even know, bro. I would be flipping shit all them kids there. I don't know if I'd be able to keep Michael. I'd be like, we're, we're going to die. Yeah. Make your piece of baby Jesus. That's all I can say. It was not at all a typical Damn. Californian city. Even now, it is more in common with Midwestern farming towns than most other California cities. It's a very small American town with long hot days that bleed into one another where people know their neighbors by name and anything out of the ordinary is immediately obvious. By all accounts, the 15th of July, 1976, was unusually overcast, especially for that time of year. Okay. But otherwise, that day had started out as any other. By the end of the day, the little town would be swamped by hundreds of reporters from every corner of the country. Damn. In total, the hostages... This is crazy. Hostages, ...kidnapping victims would... Oh my god, and we still got 20 minutes left, so it's gonna get fucking worse. Oh shit, can we just call it a day here and, you know, just be like, everyone enjoy their Halloween. Man, this is a really fucked up video to have on Halloween. They were on the road for a total of 12 hours driving more than a hundred miles from where they'd started. That's 12 hours and a hundred miles in the sweltering California summer heat. No water, no toilets, no nothing. The kids tried to look after each other. If you don't have water, you don't need a toilet that much. Just saying. And Ed and the older children led them in singing songs and trying to keep them from panicking during this endless torture. The only thing worse though than their conditions was not knowing if they would live to see tomorrow or not. Bro, he didn't even have like Katy Perry or T-Swizzle to sing to the, those poor kids, man. They wasn't even born then. It was in the middle of the night when they finally slowed and then stopped and the doors were opened. <laughs> no fire. I'm a firework. We're gonna die. 
but I doubt there was any relief. Outside it was pitch black. They had no idea where they were. This was about like four something AM. They couldn't see anything around them, only the kidnappers' flashlights. One by one, Ed and the 26 children were ferried from the back of those two vans to a small hole in the middle of the dirt. A small black hole, pitch black down there. In the hole was a 12 foot ladder going straight down. And they were being forced into that hole, not knowing what the heck was down there. Before each of them was sent down the ladder, they were stripped to their underwear, starting with Ed. He was first and he was given a flashlight before being told to head down the ladder. At the same time, the kidnappers took a roll call of their victims. One of them asking names, and the other scrawling their answers on an old fast food bag. At the bottom of the hole then, they found what would be their jail cell, and a very hot and sweltering one, suffocating one, at that. The makeshift underground bunker was in fact an old truck trailer, buried almost 12 feet underground and topped off with tons of rocks and dry dirt. The kidnappers had prepared for their guests' arrival. Not only had they created toilets by digging out deep holes under each of the rear wheel wells, they had left several loaves of bread, jars of peanut butter, boxes of cereal, and large jugs of water. So they had a little bit in this place, but Ed's immediate worry was the lack of oxygen. That many people, even that many small people, but still in that tight a space. The trailer yeah. was 8 feet by 16 feet, so it's pretty small when you're when there's 27 people in there. The kidnappers though had thought of that and put in two ventilation shafts that, that let in air, but just about let in air. It was still extremely hard to breathe in there, extremely hot, and claustrophobia set in for those 27 people in there. Ed's next worry was just how deep they were. Could the roof sustain the weight of the earth above? He knew though there was, I mean, there's little you can do about it. You just gotta try and Try and wait it out, hope, hope rescue comes. Try and just keep yourself and the kids from panicking. Bro, I'm panicking and I'm not even fucking there. I, I do not do good in tight places like that with did. Oh. started to freak out a little bit damn yeah i don't do tight 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 play oh no gotta have that room bro and losing your minds down there down there though in this tiny dark suffocating box though they didn't know it yet ed and the kids were now more than 100 miles northwest from where they'd been taken in chowchilla they were now in livermore california However, back in Churchilla, the alarm had been raised almost immediately when the- Damn, they took them that far. I mean, on, from that, that smart on there is like, you, you wouldn't want to do it really close because, you know, they're going to be out there searching the shit. But damn, they, they really thought, like, they did some heist prep, bruh. Kids didn't make it home. There was no, no faffing about whatsoever. But the authorities had no idea where they were. It was almost like they were using an in-person VPN of some kind. Like NordVPN, who also just so happened to be the best in the business at keeping <laughs> your little booty safe online, just like they do mine. That was a really good segue, bro. <laughs> Motherfucker, that was really good. Man. In this day and age of constant security breaches, Nord is the app that will keep you and your online activity safe. Nord has the very best VPN Damn. out there. Believe me, I tried a few and nothing compares to Nord's. I use it almost every single day. And with a single click, it'll change your online address from where you are to wherever you want to be so that your location is safe and secure. With one tap, I'm not in Ireland anymore. I'm in South Korea. Anyang Haseo. Cybersecurity these days is so important and that is where Nord shines. With its features like Nord's mesh nets, where you can safely connect to any device in the world. No wires, no nothing. 
And now that it is back to school season, Nord have a very special deal that is just for you. Yes, you. They won't even let me have it. I asked, I was crying, and they said no. Only for my viewers. Using my special link, nordvpn.com slash that chapter, every purchase of a two year plan will receive four months extra for free. Yes, free. Can you believe it? I had to do a spit no. take when they told me. Get that using this link or the one in the description. And of course, NordVPN has data scanners. Or how about Nord's threat protection, keeping you safe from any hackers, malicious websites, trackers, phishing, ransomware, be gone. So once again, please use my special link, that is nordvpn.com slash that chapter to get an amazing deal just for you. Every two year purchase gets four months for free on top. Nord of course has a 30 day money back guarantee so you know you can trust them. Thank you so Damn. much to NordVPN for sponsoring that chapter. It's good deal. Now let's get back into it. It didn't take long for the police to realize the bus and the kids and the driver were gone for no good reason whatsoever. The search had in fact already started before Ed and the kids had even made it to the Livermore Rock Quarry where they were now buried alive. Good evening. There may never have been as anguishing a mystery. 26 school children and their bus driver have vanished in California's San Joaquin Valley. Vanished without a clue. Only their abandoned bus has been found. Literally within two hours of- I like that guy's voice. And that's the way the cookie crumbles. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The kids and Ed being taken, authorities had a plane in the air. And by that evening, it was national news. President Gerald Ford and the Californian governor, Jerry Brown, both gave all law enforcement agencies involved in the search for the children carte blanche to do whatever they needed, whatever the cost, to find missing kids and get them home. Now, everything had gone so smoothly for the kidnappers. You would think this is the work of very, very you know, well-prepared, well-armed, well-equipped professionals. Yeah. Right? And so, like, you know, with all things, the rumor mill, you know, punched its way into high gear. Soon people began talking. Was this the work of the Zodiac? Maybe. Maybe it was the work of prisoners who had escaped a, a nearby jail and something, something. Who knows? Maybe it's the Russians. Everybody and their dog was. Uh, I mean, my first thing would be like, is it is there? Oh. Oh, this was in the 70s. They didn't have the little red dots, did they? Oh, they're fucked. Blamed at this point. But terror was everywhere. So after dropping off their very valuable cargo, the tree kidnappers had gone back to their base of operations and were now preparing their demands. This was a ransom. The only problem though, and this is kind of when the story changes a little bit from being pretty horrific to kind of like something out of a Coen Brothers movie. Very darkly humorous because the ransomers, they were trying to call up to state the ransom. They're trying to call the police and the tip lines and everything like that to say, we have the kids, this is their demands. But they couldn't get, get true to them because the phone lines were all blocked up by other people calling in tips about this story, which was now national news. So with the police phone lines being so overwhelmed, the kidnappers were like, shit. Fuck. So instead, they were like, all right, um, let's have a little thinky think about this. That's oh, that's fun. great. But right, these rocket surgeons decided, you know what, let's let's go. Just It's pretty exhausting driving those 100 miles. How about we just go for a little nap? We'll call them later. Meanwhile, back at the quarry, Ed and the kids were doing their best to try and figure a way out for themselves out of the situation. As I said, Ed was worried that they were going to run out of air and they were all going to suffocate to death in there or the roof would collapse and they would be buried alive. I mean, they already were buried alive, but like, buried worse. alive more. Worse. Much worse. They still had no idea why they'd been taken, where they'd been taken to, never mind who'd done it. And so, with a million questions running through their heads, Ed and the older kids struggled to try and move the large and very heavy metal sheet that was covering an opening on the top of the truck. Ed and the oldest boy eventually managed to shift the sheet. They had no idea that it also had been weighed down by two 45 kilo, 100 pound industrial batteries. It had taken hours to move that cover and they still had a long and arduous way to get to freedom. They didn't really know how, how down or how deep 
they were buried. So Ed and a couple of the kids, they, they propped up these mattresses inside the trailer while one of the boys started digging his way up out and he would pass down the dirt and the people down in the trailer, the kids down the trailer would, would spread out amongst them and he kept doing that for hours and hours and hours until he saw light. It must have seemed like a never ending task. It was 16, they were down there for 16 hours trying to dig their way out until they finally made it and one by one they were able to climb their way out while a hundred miles away there was this insane national search it was all over the news 26 children and ed managed to crawl out of this buried trailer in the middle of this quarry they had no idea where they were the only thing they had they were wearing was underwear they were completely lost as you can imagine terrified sick whatever exhausted they managed to walk their way to a manned shack at the entrance of the quarry and i can only imagine the person there was pretty surprised to see them. The kids and Ed Ray managed to walk out of the gates, physically unharmed, other than minor cuts and bruises, but carrying psychological scars that would haunt them for the rest of their lives. They were checked over briefly at the scene before being loaded up and onto a new bus, which they must, must have loved that, and driven to a nearby rehabilitation center, the closest facility that could handle them all. Once there, they were fed and checked over properly by emergency responders and all found to be in good physical health. By this stage, the kidnappers had woken up from their little nap, bleary-eyed. Those poor babies. Oh my god, I wouldn't go back to school. There, you couldn't make me. I would never want to be on a field trip again. I would never want to go back. No, I'd be done. It'd be over. Mm-mm. Public transportation's ruined forever you know turn on the tv and saw the news that their kidnap kidnapping victims had a, had freed themselves and had escaped and the kidnappers hadn't even gotten a chance to send in their demands and now they had nothing the hostages were then finally returned to chowchilla by bus this time with a police escort shortly before daybreak on saturday the 17th of july 1976 by that afternoon, all of the kids and Ed were safely back home. The sheriff's office and the FBI were following up on every single tip that came in, right? They uh, they, they dug out the, the trailer that was buried in the quarry to scour for any clues as to who could have done this. Investigators quickly discovered that the trailer had been buried in the quarry for eight months, being put there in November 1975. Damn. For obvious reasons, it was the quarry's owner, Frederick Nickerson Woods, who was, you know, first scrutinized as to, you know, were you involved? It, he owned the was land, he? he owned the quarry that this had happened in. They started by searching his 100-acre estate in Portola Valley, over 130 miles away from the quarry. Frederick, he's a very wealthy man, he owned quarries and land and blah 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 all over the place. He was yeah. money bags, mister. Frederick now, by the way, he had nothing to hide but his 24 year old son frederick woods the fourth had a fair bit to hide and consequently was nowhere to be found he's 24 years old in this picture wow he looks like shit not mean it didn't take long for them to find that his two best friends 24 year old james schoenfeld and his younger brother 22 year old richard schoenfeld the gruesome twosome they all almost look like the same fucking person had also seemingly vanished Authorities, they prepared to issue an all-points bulletin to try and find these three missing men who now, it definitely seemed like were their prime suspects, Shady the sheriff's shit, office, bruh. the FBI, they were all preparing for what they actually started to believe would be an international manhunt. Hell yeah. To find them. We the love manhunts. The itself is centered in both California and Nevada on the theory that the suspects like would very well have headed east. I like the little manhunt picture. That's... It's so cute. Oh. Being sought are three men puppy. and two vans. The tree suspects were all men of considerable means. Frederick's father and his family were obviously wealthy, owning the quarry and several other lucrative businesses. And the Schoenfeld brothers were sons of a wealthy podiatrist. Which it makes the whole story of the kidnapping and the ransom that they didn't even, even get stupider? to all the more strange. It's not like they needed money. Like, they came from wealth. But as I said, they didn't even get a chance to ask for it. This story is ludicrous. Before the hunt could even kick into full gear, however, on July 23rd, just over a week since the kidnapping, 
Richard Schoenfeld, accompanied by his father and attorney, surrendered to police in Oakland. He was held on $1 million bail. His brother, James, and Fred Woods were caught three days later. Fred Woods, who's kind of like thought to be the ringleader of this whole operation, he had fled to Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, and he was actually arrested outside of a post office by RCMP officers who were, you know, alerted by the FBI in America to be on the lookout for this guy. And then um, James only got so far as Menlo Park in San Francisco before he was, he was actually preparing to give himself up by the time he's arrested. As you can see, these are not like career criminals. The no, trial was moved to it. Alameda <laughs> County because of just how infamous the crime had become where it happened in Madeira County. On July 25th, 77, all three suspects became convicted perpetrators when they all pled guilty to 27 counts of kidnapping for ransom. In return, the state dropped 18 counts of robbery. The evidence was pretty overwhelming, um, which I haven't even gotten to when they did the search of the property where it's believed this whole thing was orchestrated. So they, but anyway. I like the little smirk he had. I'm excited. They didn't really have it. They knew they were going <laughs> to go away. They didn't have a hope in hell. See, because during the search of the Woods estate, when they were still trying to find these guys, investigators discovered a draft of a ransom note, which they'd signed off with Beelzebub. The note asked for $2.5 million in return for the children, which they later increased to $5 million, which is about $25 million in today's money. Authorities also had a copy of the handwritten play-by-play -play instructions the inept gang had written out in preparation for the kidnapping. James later told uh, an interviewer that, that the three of them had heard on the news that California was having a surplus of $5 million in its budget. <gasps> and they thought to themselves, $5 million? That could be our money. The only way they could think to get their hands on the money was a kidnapping, and they reasoned that the state would pay the most for children. It was as simple and cold as that. You might wonder why they didn't all just like run away or just why would they even do this in the first place it was five million dollars is a lot of money as i said five million back then it's 25 million today but still yeah. they came from wealthy families the risk probably doesn't equal the reward probably well, you not. Can answer that one i suppose the answer is both shocking and underwhelming they just wanted the money and now it was said like that fred and james were in debt but i mean they both came from wealthy families so i think they probably would have been all right they just wanted money. Simple as that. And they thought kidnapping children and burning them alive was the great A plan. Okay. In fact, the plan got even better. We didn't even get into the good part of the plan, which unfortunately they didn't follow through with, but I would have loved that they had. The kidnapper's notebook revealed an insane but awesome plan. It involved knocking out the driver with some chloroform. Then they were going to hijack a plane, as you do, uh, loaded with dummies though, and then throw the dummies out of the plane wearing parachutes. You know, so they would think that was the children while they flew away. And they'd even planned on getting hold of an x-ray truck, an x-ray truck and lead vests, so they could check the money when they were finally given it to make sure there was no, no tracers or nothing implanted like within the money. Thought of everything. These guys couldn't even stay awake without needing a nap long enough to see how their plan actually ended badly. <laughs> He's Never got mind a point. He's got a point. somehow get a hold of a portable x-ray machine. Maybe they thought they would escape to the moon too. The point of all this testimony is an attempt by the prosecution to show that there was indeed a great deal of bodily harm oh, inflicted on the Chowchilla kidnap victims. If they can establish that to the satisfaction of Judge Leo Deegan, then the three defendants could be sentenced to life imprisonment without possibility of parole. I hope on they December 15th, 1977, all three men were found guilty of three counts of kidnapping with bodily harm. It would usually end with mandatory sentence of life in prison, but the three were given the slightly lesser sentence of life with the possibility of parole. James and Richard Schoenfeld were both paroled first. Richard, aged 57, in June of 2012, and James, aged 63, in August of 2015. Fred Woods, the apparent ringleader, served the longest before being finally paroled in August of 2022 at the age of 70. Ed Ray was considered a hero to the day he died, Damn. aged 91, in May of 2012. On February 26th, 2015, which would have been Ed Ray's 94th birthday, the city of Chowchilla officially renamed the largest park in the city, Ed Ray Park. Hell the 26th yeah. of February is known it. as Ed Ray Day in Chowchilla. 
Obviously, it's you know pretty funny to poke fun at how stupid and bad this plan went and how those the brain trust over. Yeah, it, that part is hilarious. But man, those kids and that poor fella are traumatized for life. Did he continue driving the bus after that? Like, I wouldn't. Here, I'd be out. Everything wrong, and they're clearly idiots. But this um this whole event had some real, like. Horror. shocking aftermath to some people you know some of the victims they had psychological trauma they still live with the trauma of what happened to them being buried alive some ended up with multiple arrests with substance abuse issues yeah being stripped down to your skivvies thrown inside of a hole having to claw and dig your way out all because someone wants some money like it's not even because like it's not even like something you'd see in the movies like I gotta take over the world like you can't be part of a cool story like it's like why but why did you have to go through this because three pieces of shit wanted a little extra money at least want to kick ass story out Jews others suffer with nightmares even to this day and refuse to talk about the the kidnapping they all required therapy and years of help and many still suffer over the years, the kidnappers all apologized many times for their actions. And to be fair, each has grown old in prison and missed out on living their lives outside of a small prison cell. That's their Essentially, problem. Essentially, they themselves, in the end, were buried alive. Good. Who knows if they're really evil they, or not? I'll leave that to what you they to decide. It's what they deserve. Because I, who knows if the kidnappers would have actually left their hostages to die in that buried trailer or not? Would they have left them to rot in there? If they hadn't seen that the hostages had managed to escape on the news, they very well may have gone back for them and freed them and called the whole thing off. They only ran and abandoned them once they knew they'd been found. Though the hostages may have also died if they hadn't freed themselves. No one knew where they were. Who knows if they would have gone back for them. And also, the roof was caving in. Either way, what happened was the best outcome for everybody. It was a terrible, stupid, and horrific plan. I, I don't think I would go so, so far to call these guys evil. Because I don't really think they're evil. I just think they're very, very stupid. I agree. And it's probably best for everybody else that they were in prison this whole time. And that will do I agree. it for this whole video. Thank you. Man, Mike, see, we think alike, bud. I agree 100%. The world is a better place with them in there. And it would probably be an even better place if they was all still in there. Instead of being out. I don't give a fuck how old they are. You mess with kids, man. You you don't deserve to have a life after that. Period. You don't. I, I can't I, I can't handle that. Like adults is one thing, like but whenever kids are brought to a situation, whoever's doing the crime, I'm sorry, it, they need life, period. If you're getting time and it's gonna be a long time for doing whatever you did to the kid, it just go ahead and make a life. You don't need to be out, you don't need to be free. No other kid needs to have that potential that you're gonna do it to them. They should have died in there. That's my opinion. And I'm okay with that. Alright, I really enjoyed today's video. If y'all enjoyed today's videos as much as I did, please go down there and leave a thumbs up. While you're down there going over, ding that bell. It don't work very often, but it might. And if you want to ding that bell, then that means you must want to subscribe. Go ahead. Take your time. I'll give you a moment. Welcome. All right. And if you want, go down to the description. Check out the Bill 5000 store. We got some new merch up and we even got some stuff up for the holidays. That way, in case you want to, you know, spread the cheer of Bill 5000 to your family, go right on ahead. As always, be good to one another. I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye. Man, I. It was a horrifying story, but yet hilarious, hilarious all at the same time. Like, it's like reading a Goosebumps book, bruh.